welcome. We are getting into Goddard today, and I am so excited. Neville Goddard is one of the thought pioneers of the 20th century and into this century. He was born in 1905. He died in, I think, 1972. He was actually born in Barbados, but he taught on self-development, on mysticism. He taught on manifestation, and he often used biblical scriptures and principles in order to teach deeper layers of esoteric teaching on the subject of manifestation. And one of his primary focal points was the reality that we create our external world. We create today what we experience tomorrow. And the body of his work is Neville trying to explain the spiritual principles behind this and in such a way that we can understand and begin to use them to manifest a new way of life for ourselves. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to be diving into this classic book by Neville Goddard, which is called Feeling is the Secret. This version has really large font and it's only 33 pages which is a master number. It's the number of Christ consciousness, but it's only 33 pages. It is really small. But when I tell you that this book has changed my life, I keep this book and also this book on my nightstand. And every night I read about five to 10 minutes of Goddard just to program and prime myself before I go to sleep. And I highly recommend that if you want to go with me through the works of Goddard, that you at least get feeling is the secret. And I highly recommend that you also get the Neville Goddard complete reader. This contains all of the work that I'm going to be going through probably this year. And I want to do this each Friday um, with all of you because this isn't the Bible, <laughs> but Neville references the Bible quite a lot. But this is kind of like my Bible. And so I'm going to call this Neville Studies. <laughs> I used to go to Bible study way back in the day. And this is going to be a time of Neville Study. I'd like to meet with all of you each Friday at 2 p.m. Central. And we're just going to go through chapter by chapter and work by work and dive into this work. And let me tell you something about Neville Goddard and the way that he writes and also the way that he talks. You can go up on YouTube and you can actually hear his voice. Again, he's from the Barbados. He has an interesting accent. And when he was a child, his teacher actually told him that he would never amount to anything because of the way that he spoke. And he sure proved her wrong. In fact, he used that to motivate him to go on and to teach thousands and now millions of people. But in the work of Neville Goddard, hear me when I say there are built in spiritual codings and attunements. And as I read through this work, I feel these attunements moving through me and you're going to feel them too if you are present with this work. Guaranteed. The words themselves as they're expressed out and received by you, have the power to embed and to begin to shift and activate principles of energy within you. Trust me, that's how powerful this work is. Again, we're starting with feeling is the secret. Today we are just doing chapter one, but there's a few things you need to know about this work before we begin. Let me pull up a little, there's a couple of notes that I have here. First and foremost, Neville repeats himself. Neville repeats himself over and over again. And if you're a reader, you might find this a little annoying, but there's a reason that he does this because it's kind of like a spiral. If you feel into the words as we talk about them, it's kind of a spiral that is embedding deeper and deeper. And with each repetition, it embeds even more deeply. So that's the reason he repeats himself. You will notice that I'll often repeat a passage in Neville's work even if he's repeated it, <laughs> I'll repeat it too, because it's kind of a mic drop moment. This is something we need to listen to. Now, also Neville, being of the, the previous century and a previous time, he wrote in somewhat of a old timey kind of way. And some of the ways that he phrases things might be hard to understand. So you will find me breaking down some of the, the uh, words so that we all kind of understand and have an awareness of what Neville is talking about. So 
just know that there's a lot of repetition and there's going to be exposition on my part. There's going to be teaching that's coming through from spirit that we all need to hear as we go through this. So please know that. Also, Neville often speaks in Christian terminology, and this might put off some folks who are averse to organized religion or Christianity, but I would like to encourage you to just suspend any triggers around that because there's a deeper meaning to the text that he is quoting. And, and we'll actually get into some of that in this first chapter. It's not about the religion. It's about it's about the magic in the words that he's quoting. So just try to be with the, the words as we are taking them in. Next, buy his books. I just, I've benefited so much from his books and I don't want, I mean, I, I hope that his estate is still benefiting from people buying his books. He's also on Audible. Feeling is a secret is on Audible. Like buy his books, contribute to this because this, this work is powerful. And again, I would recommend that you have these books by your nightstand. Make it a spiritual discipline to read through these every night because it makes a difference. Okay, enough talking. You'll notice here that there's a link below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're watching in the lab, and that link is to the Light Shine Lab. Um, if you want to check it out, go to lightshinelab.com. That's my spiritual community that I founded in 2016. <laughs> I always get it wrong. I think it was 2016. And we've got about 10,000 members. We have intuitive spiritual readers and teachers and healers who go live every day and offer their services for free to members. Go to that link, check it out, and join us if you would like. Without further ado. And we just want to set the space for this. If you could take a deep breath with me, please. And exhale that out. Because I truly believe that what is shared today is going to be life shifting and consciousness altering for many of you, whether you're watching this live on or on replay, it doesn't matter. The spiritual coding and the attunements are contained within this teaching. And if you open your heart and your mind to this, you will receive a blessing and you will receive a shift in spirit. This is what we ask for. We came into this incarnation with a purpose and we are magical beings who can create our own reality. And so many of us have lost our way. We have forgotten this and we need to be put back on the path. And that's what this work is here to do. Spirit, we just thank you for being present and our divine emissaries, thank you for facilitating this masterful teaching. In God's name and spirit's name, aloha, mahalo kia kua, amen. It's a masterful teaching, not because of me, it's because of Neville, okay? The foreword to Feeling is the Secret. This book is concerned with the art of realizing your desire. It gives you an account of the mechanism used in the production of the visible world, the visible world being the world that you can see and the life you're presently living. It is a small book, but it's not slight. There is a treasure within it, a clearly defined road to the realization of your dreams. Were it possible to carry conviction to another by means of reasoned arguments and detailed instances, this book would be many times its size. However, it is seldom possible to do this by means of written statements or arguments, since to the suspended judgment, it always seems plausible to say that the author was dishonest or deluded and therefore this evidence was tainted. And so Neville is telling us right now, consequently, I have purposely omitted all arguments and all testimonials and simply challenge the open-minded reader or hearer to practice the law of consciousness as it is revealed in this book. Personal success will prove far more convincing than all of the books that could be written on the subject. What Neville is saying is, I'm not here to prove anything to you. I'm here to give you the keys and you take them if you want. If your heart is open, you can utilize it. The book is small, but it is not slight. All right, we're getting into chapter one. We are only doing chapter one. Expect to be here for about an hour or an hour and a half, even though it's only about nine pages, as we have a lot to talk about. Chapter one is called Law and Its Operation. 
This is the law of creation. This is how manifestation works. You ready? Let's get into it. Turn that off. The world and all within it is man's conditioned consciousness objectified. When Neville says objectified, he means made into an object, the external world that we experience. Consciousness is the cause as well as the substance of the entire world. So it is to consciousness that we must turn if we would discover the secret of creation. And that is what we are here to do. Knowledge of the law of consciousness and the method of operating this law will enable you to accomplish all that you desire in your life. Knowing how consciousness works and understanding the mechanics of consciousness will enable you to get everything you want in this life. Armed with a working knowledge of this law, you can build and maintain an ideal world, a world for yourself and a world that we share. Consciousness is the one and only reality, not figuratively, but actually. So many of us identify reality as that which we see with our senses and experience external, externally. But what Neville is telling us is that no, consciousness is the substance of that. And consciousness is the substance of you. It makes everything happen. Nothing has been created outside of consciousness. Neville says, this reality may, for the sake of clarity, be likened unto a stream which is divided into two parts, the conscious and the subconscious. Pay attention here because let me break it down for you. We are the consciousness. And as a consciousness, we are whole. But in order to understand the mechanics of how consciousness moves and creates, we can liken it to a stream that is divided into two parts. The first part being conscious, which I tend to put up here because it identifies with thinking, and the subconscious, which I tend to put down here because it, it identifies as the womb of creation. These two parts plus a third integral part make up the mechanics of our consciousness, who it is that we are. In order to intelligently operate the law of consciousness, it is necessary to understand the relationship between the conscious and the subconscious. We got to understand what's going on. The conscious, Neville says, is personal and selective. The subconscious is impersonal and non-selective. Stay with me. The conscious is the realm of effect. The subconscious is the realm of cause. These two aspects are, if you will, the male and the female divisions of consciousness. Conscious is the world of effect, that which is created, that comes about as a result of the cause. What caused that to be created? And the cause is the subconscious the female aspect. The conscious generates ideas and impresses these ideas upon the subconscious. The subconscious receives ideas and gives form and expression to them. And thus is the whole of the law. This is what you must understand. The conscious, the male aspect of who it is that we are. And whether you're female or male, you have a male aspect. You also have a female aspect. The conscious is Rodin's thinking man. It is the part of us that has a vision. And, you know, the Bible says the people perish for a lack of vision. It's our good ideas. It's our affirmative thoughts. But it's also our bad ideas, our negative trains of thinking. This all is taking place in the domain of the conscious, the male aspect. The subconscious, the female aspect, receives the impressions of the conscious, all those thoughts, all those ideas, that vision or the negativity, the lower vibrational thinking, if you will, the subconscious receives that. And as you'll see, 
the subconscious always says, yes. Okay. Perfect. Yes. By this law, first conceiving an idea and then impressing the idea conceived upon the subconscious, all things evolve out of consciousness. And without this sequence, there is not anything made that is made. Nothing in creation is created outside of this sequence. Consciousness, conscious, and subconscious. And I would dare say that God creator has these same aspects within God creator is first the God that had the idea to create and then was the God, the subconscious that had the means and the mechanism to give birth to it as women do. The conscious impresses the subconscious while the subconscious expresses all that is impressed upon it. Be clear, the subconscious does not originate ideas, but rather accepts as true those which the conscious mind feels to be true, and in a way, known only to itself, objectifies the accepted ideas. This is a little old-timey, let's break it down. The conscious comes up with the thoughts, and by feeling the thoughts in the consciousness, impresses those thoughts, those ideas, that vision on the subconscious, which is the womb of creation. And the subconscious receives it into the womb, and it is fertilized. And she sets about in a way known only to herself. The mechanics of the subconscious is known to the subconscious. We don't have to worry about that. But immediately she sets about creating this, giving birth to this in the likeness, in the likeness of the conscious. Therefore, through his power to imagine and feel and his freedom to choose the idea that he'll entertain, man has control over creation. One more time. Therefore, through his power to imagine and to feel and his freedom to choose the idea he will entertain, man has control over creation. Control of the subconscious is accomplished through control of your ideas and your feelings. So we started off consciousness umbrella. And the two aspects of the male, which is the conscious, and the female, which is the subconscious. But there is a mechanism that allows these two to communicate. And without this mechanism or this vehicle, they do not communicate. And no impressions are made upon the subconscious. And so she does not create unless this thing happens. Again, the title of the book is your indication of what that will be. Control of the subconscious is accomplished through control of your ideas and your feelings. The mechanism of creation is hidden in the very depth of the subconscious, the female aspect or the womb of creation. The subconscious transcends reason and is independent of induction. The subconscious contemplates a feeling as fact existing within itself. And on this assumption, the subconscious proceeds to give expression to it. This is so powerful. The subconscious considers a feeling a fact. And based on this, sets about to express it or create it. And this is beautiful. And this is terrifying. Why? And we have to stop here. Because so many of us live lives where we're not paying attention to how we're thinking or how we're feeling. We are reactive in the way that we live our lives. Maybe we spend a lot of time in front of a television and we don't even notice that we're thinking about what we're watching, maybe CNN, maybe the Real Housewives of somewhere where they're screaming, right? We don't even pay attention to what we're watching and what we're thinking, but we're also being kind of induced into a state of subconsciousness as we do it. We're feeling. We're feeling aggravated and anxiety. Maybe we're feeling anger and we're thinking and we're feeling. And that is how the impression takes place on the subconscious. 
That's how it happens. And so what Neville is going to be imploring us to do is to become mindful of how you're thinking. First and foremost, we cannot be reactively thinking, but most importantly, how you are feeling because the feeling is the signal. Without the feeling, nothing is created. How you feel today is probably in alignment with what you're thinking as well. And how you feel today is going to create your experience, your tangible reality tomorrow. And until you get that under control, how you think and how you feel, you cannot shift and change your life in the way that you want to. One more time. The subconscious contemplates a feeling as a fact or considers a feeling to be a fact existing within itself and on this assumption proceeds to give expression to it. The creative process begins with an idea and its cycle runs its course as a feeling and then ends in a volition to act. Ideas are impressed on the subconscious through the medium of feeling. No idea can be impressed on the subconscious until it is felt. No idea can be impressed on the subconscious until it is felt. But once it's felt, good or bad or indifferent, it has to be expressed. That's the terrifying part. Once it's felt, it has to be expressed. Feeling is the one and only medium through which ideas are conveyed to the subconscious. Therefore, the man who doesn't control his feeling may easily impress the subconscious with undesirable states. That's what we're doing while we're watching CNN, Fox News, getting agitated, feeling it in our body. That's your vibration. That's your incarnate embodied vibration. And if what that is is anxiety or fear, or depression, and you're also thinking complementary thoughts to that, you are creating that for yourself. Therefore, the man who does not control his feeling may easily impress the subconscious with undesirable states. By control of feeling is not meant restraint or suppression of your feeling, but rather the disciplining of yourself to imagine and entertain only such feeling as contributes to your happiness. Here Neville is saying, it is human to feel stuff. Lots of us have been through stuff and we feel that and that's okay. And it may be fear in a moment and it may be anger or rage or grief in a moment. But what we're called to do is to be mindful and intentional and disciplined of what that feeling is doing for us in a creative sense. So you can feel the feeling, but you can't indulge a negative feeling. You can allow pain to move through you, but suffering is a state of being. It's a vibration and it's creative. So we're not pretending things don't happen. We're not pretending life isn't hard sometimes, but we're not indulging our negative feelings about conditions and experiences because therein we create more of the same. You dig? Does that make sense for everybody? But rather, the disciplining of oneself to imagine and entertain only such a feeling as contributes to your happiness. Control of your feeling is all important to a full and happy life, period. Control of your feelings, how you're vibrating, is all important to a full and happy life. Another thing that Neville Goddard said is that being and believing are one. We believe with our thinking mind. It's a thought, it's an idea, it's an intention. Believing and being are the same thing. We vibrate, we feel, we emote in alignment to how we are believing and we are thinking. And so the disciplined man and woman is intentional in their thinking process, does not entertain for long lower vibrational thoughts because she knows that that's going to create more of the same. 
Never entertain an undesirable feeling, nor think sympathetically about wrong in any shape or form. Do not dwell on the imperfection of yourself or others. To do so is to impress upon your subconscious, which is the womb of creation, these limitations. What you do not want done to you, do not feel that it's done to you or to anybody else. This is the whole of the law for a full and happy life. Everything else is just commentary. It's a mic drop. That's what that is. Let's read that again. Do not dwell on the imperfection of yourself or others. How many of us do this? We struggle with self-worth. We struggle with our bodies. We struggle with our pasts. We struggle with the signaling, the marketing, the programming that we've been saturated in all our lives. We find ourselves to be imperfect and we feel this as well. And so we perpetuate this. And Neville is saying, don't do that. Do not dwell on the imperfection of yourself or others. To do so is to continually tell the subconscious to create it. What you do not want done to you, don't do to yourself and don't feel about yourself and don't feel about anybody else that way either. This is the whole of the law. This is the whole of the law for a full and happy life. Everything else is just commentary. Every feeling makes a subconscious impression. And unless it is counteracted by a more powerful feeling of an opposite nature, it must be expressed. Here we have to spend some time. Every feeling makes a subconscious impression. And so I can hear some of you now saying, well, <laughs> I've been walking around the planet feeling negatively and living reactively. I've been constantly impressing upon my subconscious these negative feelings and thoughts. And look at what I've created. I'm, I'm stuck here. Look at what I have done. What Neville is saying is, uh-uh. You can uproot what you've started to create in negativity by feeling something counteractive in nature. Let me read this again. Every feeling makes a subconscious impression. And unless it is counteracted by a more powerful feeling of an opposite nature must be expressed. So if you are someone who is prone to negative thinking, you need to train yourself to think and to feel in a stronger energy and vibration that is counteractive to that. And as a hint, there is no stronger vibration or feeling in 3D earth reality for us humans than love. Love is stronger than anything else. And if you can, instead of, like stop yourself from negative thinking, if you can stop yourself from thinking that thought, whatever it is, and move instead into a thought about love, and everybody has a thought about that. We all probably have a memory of when we felt love. A lot of us have children, and we remember when they came into the world. A lot of us have pets. I do. And I'm just bursting with love for my pets. I have a spouse. That's love. I also have memories filled with love for my childhood and different things that I've done. I can call upon that memory, and I can use it as a mechanism to feel love. And as I'm feeling that love, stay with me. As I'm feeling that love, that's the vibration, and the feeling is the secret, I can then start to intentionally think thoughts. What kind of thoughts? We'll start simple. I was created in perfection by a God who loves me. I have a purpose. I'm a magical divine being. Start simple. Well, that's the truth. And as you're thinking these thoughts about yourself and you're reprogramming the way that you think, you're feeling that vibration of love. And that is enough to counteract anything negative that you thought today because it's stronger. And that is stronger and will counteract anything negative that you thought about yesterday. The longer you stay in the vibe of that and in the thought of that, the more powerful it is. And see, here's where people... 
I don't want to use the word fail, but we, we, we create vision boards, right? And we cre- create affirmations and we place them around our house, but we don't really manifest based on our vision board. Some people do, but a lot of us don't, or maybe we'll manifest one thing, but not a lot of the other things. How come? Why is that? It's because you're not feeling, you're not actually causing within yourself a vibration that is a match for the thing that you're trying to manifest that's really good, that feels really good. All you're doing is reciting an affirmation, words. All you're doing is looking at your your vision board and that awesome mansion or that beautiful car that you'd love to have someday, but you're not feeling it. You're not feeling it. And so those two things never meet and cause an impression on the subconscious. So practice. Everybody start practicing today. Feeling what love feels like. Feeling what love feels like. And just being in the vibe of that, as simple and as beautiful as it is. You don't even have to add thoughts to it yet. Just learn how to feel love in your body because that is the strongest energy and it counteracts the negative effortlessly. And you'll notice when you're feeling love in your body, the thoughts fall into place. The vibration dictates the alignment of the thinking. When you're feeling love in the body, wow, you get creative. When you're feeling love in the body, wow, you get inspired and motivated and compassionate and service oriented. That all comes from love. So if we can all just get into touch with how to do that in our bodies and feel that and work on expanding that in our experience, maybe we start with like 30 seconds. I got this love in my body. I'm remembering my dog from when I was a child and, oh, I loved my dog. I can do that for 30 seconds. And as a discipline, we continue to work with this. And maybe after a week, we're up to 20 minutes. That's beautiful. What does Esther Hicks say? She says, if you can match the vibration to the affirmation or to the thought, the vision for 16 seconds, you're manifesting. 16 seconds. Well, what if you could do it for 20 minutes? What if you could do it for a half an hour? And what if within that half an hour, as you're vibrating with love, because you're practicing, you're remembering You're also thinking a people perish for a lack of vision. So you've got your vision and you're thinking about it. You've got your intention and you're thinking about it and you're vibing. That's how you do it. Now you're cooking with gas. Now you're changing your entire life. Love is the strongest energy and it counteracts anything negative. Okay. I just wanted to say that before we go on. The dominant of two feelings is the one that is always created. The dominant of the two feelings is the one that's all always created. And the most dominant is love. Neville says, I am healthy is a stronger feeling than I will be healthy. Let's do that together. Let's all say that together. Let's start with, I am healthy. Let's all say, I am healthy. I am healthy. I am healthy. Do you feel that? Feel strong. Like I've got a column of power. I am healthy. Now let's switch it up and say, I will be healthy. And let's feel the difference. I will be healthy. I will be healthy. I will be healthy. It feels weaker, doesn't it? Why? Because you're putting distance between that yourself and that which you want to call into manifestation. Will be means you are not, which Neville will go on to say. I am healthy is a stronger feeling than I will be healthy. To feel I will or I will be is to confess I am not. I am is stronger than I am not. To feel I will be is to confess I am not. And I am is always stronger than I am not. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. And let the weak feel that. And now the weak becomes strong. Neville says, what you feel you are always dominates what you feel you'd like to be. Therefore, to be realized, the wish must be felt as a state that is rather than a state that is not. 
we repeat. What you feel you are always dominates what you feel you would like to be. Therefore, to be realized, to be created, the wish must be felt as a state that already is, rather than a state that is not. Sensation precedes manifestation and sensation precedes manifestation and is the foundation upon which all manifestation rests. He's using different words, but it's the same thing. Sensation is feeling. Feeling is emotion. Emotion is vibration. Feeling precedes manifestation and is the foundation upon which all manifestation rests. Be careful, therefore, of your moods and your feelings, for there is an unbroken connection between your feelings and your visible world. Your body is an emotional filter and bears the unmistakable marks of your prevalent emotions. Emotional disturbances, especially suppressed emotions, are the causes of all disease. To feel intensely about a wrong without voicing or expressing that feeling is the beginning of disease or dis ease in both the body and the environment. We have to just take a second with this because it's important to feel intensely about a wrong, about your trauma, to be triggered by your trauma, to be in the energy of your trauma and your pain and your past and your stuff and your patterns and your limitations, to feel intensely about that without voicing it or expressing that feeling, the vibration of that is the beginning of disease in your body and your environment. So not just your body, but everything you're creating, your pocketbook, your bank account, your relationships, your career. That is the beginning of disease in all of these areas. And here again, we got to go back to shadow, shadow, because Neville is not saying that we shouldn't feel things authentically. We can feel hurt. We, we can feel pain. But unless we voice them or express them, those feelings, they'll get stuck inside of us and they'll start causing disease because they're creative. All energy. All energy is creative. It's moving. It's doing something. And I'm here to tell you that a lot of us have bodies within our body. These bodies are patterns of energy that we call trauma, failure, betrayal, self-worth issues, weird beliefs that we've been harboring inside of ourselves, fears, things that we're carrying around inside of ourselves that we're not taking the time to actually acknowledge and to be with and to clear. And because of that, these patterns are taking up space in our body. And as within, so without. The more patterns and shadow and stuff we have inside of us, the more we see it in our externalized world. If you have an inner belief about your lack of self-worth or value or your creative ability, you probably don't have much in your bank account. You probably have things that seem to be promising and then they kind of fall apart at the very end because you're actually creating from patterns that exist inside of you. And unless they are expressed, unless they are moved, they'll cause disease inside of your body and also in your life. Now, there's a lot of people who talk about how to do shadow work. I am somebody, if you don't know who I am, I come from incredible trauma. I grew up in a very abusive situation. My father was a terribly terribly violent person and committed all manner of horrible acts upon my family. And I've had to deal with this in my life. I've been to therapy and analysis and I've done the things I've needed to do, but I've done shadow work and I've taken a lot of approaches. And the most effective thing for me is to get in and to get out. To get in and to get out, how do you do that? First, you must be conscious to what the pattern is. You have to, you have to admit, I have a problem. I'm very fearful. Or I have a problem. I'm very rageful. 
or I have a problem, I don't trust anybody, or I feel like I don't, I don't amount to anything, that's a problem. You have to be conscious to it. You've got to call a thing a thing in order to heal it. Once conscious to it, what I do is I find the first evidence of that in my timeline. Like, when was the first time I felt like a failure? Or when was the first time I felt invisible to people? And I'll go through my timeline and I'll find the first memory of that. And it might not actually be the first time that ever happened. It's just what I can remember in the moment. And then now I got it. I've got the conscious understanding of the pattern. I understand it's inside of me and I know where it originates for the most part. I often take an extra step and I just try to figure out where's this in my body? Because that body within your body, that pattern, it's housed somewhere. And I'll tell you right now, I got a lot of stuff in my gut. I have a lot of stuff in my, in just this area of my body. I've grown up with digestive issues and um, reproductive issues. Like it all, I've got a lot of physical and emotional stuff that was held right there. And so I'll ask spirit, spirit, where is it living right now, this pattern in my body? A lot of times for me, it's in my gut. Sometimes it's in my elbow or my knee. I just try to become aware of that because when I get in and I get out, I remember my physical instrument too. Okay, so now I know what it is. I know when it happened. And what I do next is I fill up with love. I fill up with light. And the light shined into the darkness and the darkness could not even comprehend it. The darkness doesn't even know what the light is. And furthermore, the darkness is antagonized by the light. And when I fill up with light and then go back in my timeline, I clear that darkness. I clear that pattern. And so I do whatever I have to do. I prime. Maybe I'll listen to some music that I love that puts me into contact with spirit. Maybe I'll chant. Maybe I'll pray. Maybe I'll think about my doggies. Don't get me started. <laughs> and I just love them so much. And I just let that fill me up. Oh, I love them so much. I am love, filled with love. And then when I got it and it's in me, I go back into the memory and I reimagine it. This is a skill I got from Neville. You see, because time doesn't exist in, in the way that we experience it outside of 3D. And the little girl that I was at seven years old or 10 years old or 15 years old who first felt betrayed or traumatized, she still exists, re residually speaking, energetically speaking, she's still there. And so filled with light, I go back and I get her. And I do this in the imaginal chamber of my mind. I see myself doing it. And you know what? The imagination is just as real as the physical. In fact, it's more real. It's realer than 3D reality because it's easy for spirit to move in the imagination. And in the imaginal chamber, I go back and I rescue her. I, re I rewrite how that went down. Maybe somebody hurt me. Well, I, I reimagine that I never met them in the first place. Maybe my father said something that was very painful to me. Well, I imagine him saying something different. I rewrite the story. And you know what? This works. As I vibrate in love, I rewrite the story. And I also just love the me that I was in the moment. Seven-year-old me. Oh, I love you, Crystal. You are accepted. You are beloved. You are magical. And I make the offer, come, come with me. Come back into the present whole and integrate it. And I imagine just taking her in my arms and integrating her into the whole of who I am all while I'm in the love of it. As I'm thinking and I'm feeling, guess what? I'm creating a new reality from that. And it's going to loosen in my present. It's going to loosen in my present. And I'm going to become free. Guess what that means? I'm going to release it, that pattern that body, that shadow gets released from me. And if I'm mindful and I remember, I take a breath and I drop it down into my belly or my knee or my elbow, wherever that is. And I just, I wedge it, I jostle it out of place and I release it with my breathing. I just imagine it moving 
and I release it. And I say, Mahalo, thank you. Because you know what? I needed it for whatever reason. I needed that belief. I needed to think that. And I love myself as I release that. And boom, shadow work's done. I don't spend a lot of time there. I don't spend a lot of time as a seven-year-old just going over all the crazy things that happened to me. I'm in and I'm out and I release it with a breath and boom, it is released. And so it is. I will not indulge negative feelings about anything because I know to do that creates more of the same. This is why we attract the same person over and over into our lives. This is why. Because we've got this pattern and it's creating. It is always creating. Thank you for indulging me as I wanted to share that with you. Shadow work is not meticulous. Take It can take forever, but it doesn't have to. And if you take God in there with you, guess what? God knows how to heal. God is the God of miracles. God knows how to clear that timeline right up and release that pattern. Amen? I trust that. Do not entertain, Neville says. The feeling of regret or failure or pain or suffering or betrayal for frustration or detachment from your desire causes you not to manifest this. Let me say this again. Do not entertain the feeling of regret or failure or any other negative feeling for frustration or detachment from your objective results in disease. Sorry, I worded that incorrectly. Detachment from your objective. What does that mean? Detachment from what you want to create. Detachment from your vision. Detachment from what it is you're manifesting. Spending time feeling negative things detaches you from what you want to create and always results in disease in your body or in your life. Think feelingly only of the state you desire to realize. Feeling the reality of the state sought and living and acting on that conviction is the way of all miracles. Feeling the reality of the state that you seek, that which you want to desire, and living and acting on that conviction, moving in it, is the way of all miracles. All changes of expression are brought about through a change of feeling. Changes of expression is not how you're expressing yourself. Changes of expression is what the subconscious is generating. All changes of what the subconscious is creating in your life are brought about through a change of your feeling. A change of feeling is a change of destiny. All creation occurs in the domain of the subconscious. What you must acquire then is a reflective control of the operation of your subconscious. That is control of your ideas and feelings. You have to get intentional about what you're thinking and how you are vibrating. Chance or accident is not responsible for the things that are happening to you, nor is predestined fate the author of your fortune or your misfortune. So let's get really clear about that. You're not experiencing this because of some bad luck or because of some accident or some chance of fate. Nor was this your purpose to come here and suffer or to experience lack. Your subconscious impressions determine the conditions of your world. The subconscious is not selective. It is impersonal and it is not a respecter of persons. He is saying... Nothing is happening by chance. You are not a victim of what, of this world and of, of life. You are the creator of it. It's all coming to be because of how you are impressing your subconscious, which is manifesting your life. And the subconscious is not selective. Let's remember, she just says yes, like a lover would. She just says yes to the idea and yes to the feeling and then sets about in a way known only to herself to manifest it. Good, bad, or indifferent. She just says yes. The subconscious is not concerned with the truth or the falsity of your feeling. It always accepts as true that which you feel to be true. The universe is not going to say, Crystal, are you sure you want to... <laughs> Think that thought. 
or Crystal, I don't think what you're thinking or feeling is true. So I'm going to send that back to you. That never happens. The subconscious is not concerned with the way, with the truth or the falsity of how you're feeling. It always just accepts it as true and begins to manifest. Feeling is the ascent of the subconscious to the truth of that which is declared to be true. Feeling is the ascent of the subconscious or the rising of the subconscious to the truth of that which is declared to be true. And it's all true to her, you see. It's all true to her. And she's rising through the feeling that you're feeling. The subconscious rises to accept that it's true and says yes, and it becomes fertilized and it is made manifest. Because of this quality of the subconscious, there is nothing impossible to man. Whatever the mind of man can conceive and feel to be true, the subconscious can and must objectify or make into an object, make into reality. It must manifest. Your feelings create the pattern from which your world is fashioned. And a change of feeling is a change of that pattern. One more time. Your feelings create the pattern from which your whole world is fashioned, your bank account, your relationships, your jobs, your prospects, all of it, your health, your wellness, your abundance. Your feelings create the pattern from which your world is fashioned. And a change of feeling is a change of that pattern. The subconscious never fails to express that which has been impressed upon it. In fact, the moment it receives an impression, it begins to work out the ways of its expression. It, it accepts the feeling impressed upon it, your feeling, as a fact existing within itself and immediately sets about to produce in the outer or objective world the exact likeness of that feeling. So beautiful. The conscious is the male, the husband, if you will. The subconscious is the female, the wife. And he says, I want this. I want to create this. And she says, yes. She rises to meet the truth of that and immediately sets out to express this. In love, she does this for the male. The subconscious never alters the accepted beliefs of man. It outpictures them to the last detail, whether or not they are beneficial. The subconscious never alters your beliefs. The subconscious is not going to alter your thoughts. The subconscious will not alter your vision. Rather, it outpictures them to the last detail, whether or not they are beneficial to you. So guess what? We better intentionally make them beneficial to us. To impress the subconscious with the desirable state, you must assume the feeling that would be yours had you already realized your wish. This means if you wish to be a millionaire, you've got to assume the feeling of being a millionaire. This is where we get the approximation quote, which is fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it just means put on the clothes of that, put on the energy of that. Indeed, conjure the Conjure the frequency of that and hold that, embody that, and that is how you make it. To impress the subconscious with your desirable state or what it is you want to manifest, you must assume the feeling that would be yours if you already had your wish. In defining your objective or what you want to create, you must be concerned only with the objective itself. The manner of expression or the difficulties involved are not to be considered by you. To think feelingly on any state impresses it upon the subconscious. And what he's saying here is what I think a lot of us do. He's saying all you have to do is figure out what you want to create. You don't have to worry about how. You don't have to start thinking like some of us do. We start getting into our own way. Oh, God, if I if I try to create that, then this person's going to get mad or my mom's going to disown me. Or if I start to do this, these are the difficulties. of How am I going to manage that? We start thinking about how we do that. Neville is saying the subconscious in a way known only to itself sets about to express it. Don't concern yourself with the how or the why. You just concern yourself on what it is you want to create and get into the energy of it. 
Therefore, if you dwell on difficulties, barriers, or delay, the subconscious, by its very non-selective nature, accepts the feeling of difficulties and obstacles as your request and proceeds to produce them in your outer world. The subconscious is the womb of all creation. It receives the idea unto itself through the feelings of man. It never changes the idea received, but always gives it form. Hence, the subconscious outpictures the idea in the image and the likeness of the feeling that has been received. To feel a state is hopeless or impossible is to impress upon the subconscious the idea of failure. Although the subconscious faithfully serves man, it must not be inferred or thought that the relation is that of a servant to a master as was anciently conceived. The ancient prophets called it the slave and servant of man. St. Paul personified the subconscious as a woman and said the woman should be subject to man in everything. That's what scripture said. But Neville's saying no. Neville says the subconscious does serve man, yes, and faithfully gives form to its feelings. However, the subconscious has a distinct distaste for compulsion or being made to do something and responds instead to persuasion rather than to command. Consequently, it resembles the beloved wife more than the servant. Quote, the husband is the head of the wife, Ephesians 5. May, be, may not be true of man and woman in their earthly relationship, but it is true of the conscious and the subconscious, or the male and the female as, aspects of consciousness. Here, what Neville is saying is that in earthly life, marriage between man and woman, a woman is not a servant. And the scripture is, in fact, not talking about women being servants to men, men being head of the household, women being subservient to this. He's saying the scripture is talking about creation. There's an esoteric, esoteric layer to this. The woman does serve the man. The subconscious does serve the conscious, but she does it as a lover would. She does it because she wants to outpicture as a lover or a wife would. The mystery to which Paul referred when he wrote, quote, this is a great mystery. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, and they too shall be one flesh, is simply the mystery of consciousness. Consciousness is really one and undivided, but for creation's sake, it appears to be divided into two. I am the consciousness. You are the consciousness. The consciousness having the experience is the consciousness that controls it. And I am one. I am. However, for purposes of mechanics and manifestation and creation, I have two aspects. I have two aspects. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. The conscious that intentionally thinks and feels loves the wife who then outpictures it. And the two are made one. I love that interpretation of Ephesians 5. Let me just say that. The conscious or male aspect truly is the head and dominates the subconscious or the female aspect. However, this leadership is not that of a tyrant, but that of a lover. So by assuming the feeling that would be yours were you already in possession of your objective, the subconscious is moved, persuaded to build the exact likeness of your assumption. All this, the mechanics of this, exist inside of you. You were created in the image of your creator. Did you know that? And your creator creates. And you came into this life to create. And you have everything inside of you to do it perfectly. Perfectly. But that you should know who you are. But that you should feel your power here. If you could feel this and know this and be this and think this, you would have this simple simple. So Neville says, by assuming the feeling that would be yours, 
where you are already in possession of your objective, the subconscious is moved to build the exact likeness of your assumption. Your desires are not subconsciously accepted until you assume the feeling of their reality. For only through feeling is an idea subconsciously accepted, and only through this subconscious acceptance is it ever expressed. Listen to this. It is easier to ascribe your feeling to events in the world than to admit that the conditions of the world reflect your feeling. One more time. It's easier to ascribe your feeling to the events in the world than to admit that the conditions of the world reflect your feeling. However, it is eternally true that the outside mirrors the inside. Quote, as within, so without. Quote, a man can receive nothing unless it is given him from heaven. And, quote, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Quote, a man can receive nothing unless it's given to him from heaven. And, quote, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Nothing comes from without. All things come from within, from the subconscious. It is impossible for you to see other than the contents of your consciousness. Your world in its every detail is your consciousness objectified. The world in every detail, as you're experiencing it, is your consciousness made manifest. Objective states, or that which you see, external reality, bears witness of your subconscious impressions, the way you're thinking and you're feeling. A change of impression results in a change of expression. The subconscious, the womb of creation, accepts as true that which you feel is true. And because creation is the result of subconscious impressions, you, by your feeling, determine creation. Deep breath. The subconscious accepts as true that which you feel is true. And because creation is the result of subconscious impressions, you, by your feeling, determine creation. You, Neville says, are already that which you want to be. And your refusal to believe this is the only reason you do not see it. We have to repeat that. You are already that which you want to be. You're already that. You're already magical. You're already purposeful. You're already well. You're already abundant. You're already prosperous. You're already in love. You are already that which you want to be, and your refusal to believe this is the only reason that you do not see it. Belief and being are one. Your refusal to think like this and your refusal to feel like this is the reason you don't have it. Simple. And we are winding down the chapter now. To seek on the outside for that which you do not feel you are is to seek in vain. For we never find that which we want. We find only that which we are. In short, you express, you create, and have only that which you are conscious of being or possessing. Everything you have is a result of what you are conscious of being or possessing or feeling. That's what has created your objective reality. Quote, to him that hath, it is given. And the scripture goes on to say, to him that hath not, it is taken away. And Neville doesn't explain this in this chapter, but we're going to have to break that down because law and the prophets, this is Bible that's esoteric and eternally true. To him that has, more is given. If I have the knowledge and the frequency that I am that I am, 
If I have the belief that I am love and that I am powerful and that I am a manifester and I am magical, if I have the belief that I am well and I am prosperous and good things are coming my way no matter what, like I, if I have that, more is given to me. Amen? More is given to me. But to him that hath not, to him that hath not, more will be taken away. To the person who doesn't intentionally think in the higher frequencies of love and divinity and the I am, to him that dwells in the lower vibrational frequencies of lack and scarcity and fear and anxiety and rage, more will be taken away. Choose you this day who you will serve. To him that hath, it is given. Denying the evidence of the senses and appropriating the feeling of the wish fulfilled is the way to the realization of your desire. And there's a simpler way to say this. Denying what you see in your life, your bank account, which maybe doesn't have as much as you want it to have right now, your health, which may not be as good as you'd like it to be, your living conditions, which are not optimal, denying that as the truth and instead substituting that with the feeling of your wish fulfilled is the way to realize your desire. So everything that's being signaled to you about the world and its state, everything you've come to believe about yourself, if it involves lack of worthiness and value and love and success and all those things have outpictured your present reality. And you are now in a situation which you might want to correct, right? All of us are. We all want to manifest and create. That's why we came here. To do that, you got to deny what the world is showing you. You got to deny what your bank account is showing you. We don't focus on that. We pivot and we substitute the thinking of that and the feeling of that with the feeling of our wish fulfilled. I am in love. I am healthy and well. I am working in the job of my dreams. Whatever your wish is, you don't, you deny, you turn away from the evidences of objective reality and you spend your time embodied in the vibration of the wish fulfilled. And that's how you get it. That's how you get it. Last paragraph. Now, mastery of self control of your thoughts and your feelings, this is your highest achievement. Like this is the work that we came here to do, bar none. However, until perfect self-control is attained so that in spite of appearances, you feel all that you wanna feel, until then you sleep and prayer to aid you in realizing your desired states. Sleep and prayer are the two gateways into the subconscious. So Neville is saying, so until you get it down pat, until you're, you're rocking 30 minutes of love in your body and you're, you're creating your object, you're creating your vision, you've got your beautiful idea and your inspiration, until you've managed to figure out how to do that in a way that works, spend time in sleep and in prayer because those are the doorways of the universe. And thus ends chapter one, feeling is a secret. Feeling is the Secret by Neville Goddard. Next week, Friday at 2 o'clock Central, we're going to go into Chapter 2, Sleep. If you can acquire this book by next Friday, I would highly recommend it. I like the physical book. I like to write on it. I like to take notes. I like to feel the energy of it. But it's also available on Audible. And maybe it's available... I don't know where else it's available, but I would recommend that you get this book. And if you'd like to continue with me on this journey of Neville Goddard, Neville Goddard, the complete reader contains a lot of his works, profound works that we're going to be going through one by one. I would like to conclude the teaching portion of this by summarizing what we've learned today. So, all right. Okay. Let me do. All right. Feeling is a secret chapter one summary. Number one, consciousness is made up of two parts, your conscious and your subconscious. 
too. The conscious is your male aspect. The subconscious is your female aspect. The male impresses. The female expresses. Three, consciousness comes up with ideas, with vision, with thoughts, while the subconscious receives these ideas and accepts them and sets about to manifest them. Number four, your emotions or your feelings are the vehicles through which the conscious impresses the subconscious. And your subconscious, number five, is non-selective. It is not a respecter of person. It simply says yes every time, and it must manifest it. Six, not acknowledging and releasing your suppressed emotions, your patterns, your bodies within the body, the shadow, is the root of all disease in the body, but also in the life. Seven, we must not dwell on lower ideas, thoughts, and especially feelings because these will manifest. Instead, we acknowledge them, we fill them with love and forgiveness, and we release them. Quote, Number eight, he that loveth his wife loveth himself, and they shall become one flesh. The thinking person who intentionally thinks and intentionally feels loves the wife, the subconscious, and intentionally creates his reality. Last but not least, so powerful, to him that hath, it is given, and to him that hath not, it is taken away. And so we need to get really clear about what we have and who we are and what we want to create. The people perish for a lack of vision. What does that even mean? If you don't have a goal for yourself, if you're not tuned into your purpose, if you don't know what you want to objectify or make an object out of or externalize, you're going to perish, you're going to flail, you're going to live in a reactive way. Couple that with the programming of this particular human matrix, the nonstop onslaught of lower vibrational frequency. Couple that with your reactive thinking. You have not, and it'll be continually taken away. What you have, you lose. You're in a state of perpetuity, creating what you don't want to create. So we got to get clear about what we have. And this is what I just want to say in conclusion. You are divine. Jesus said you are all gods. David Icke says, get up off your knees. Humanity, what are you doing? You're powerful. In the beginning, there was God, creator. And through the process of creation and the many iterations of creation, there came you beautiful, oversoul, I am, the consciousness of who it is that you are. And then you, like your father before you, you decided to create. And you came into this incarnation and here we are. That's who you are, magical. You are all gods. He who has that, more will be given. He who knows that and vibrates in alignment with that, more will be given and created. So let me leave you with that. That is who you are. That is who I am. We are the consciousnesses having this experience. And as such, we're in control of it. I am the creator. And so are you. Awesome, guys. I had a lot of fun. All right. <laughs> I'd like to open it up um, to some questions. And some, if you guys have observations, if you want to share anything. Um, if you're on Facebook right now, uh, if you have not yet gone to this link and activated it, I would appreciate it because that will allow me to see who you are and identify who you are. Uh, so you can go there and do that. Everybody else, though, let me just see what's going on over here. Let me say hi to y'all. I'm sorry if you were on Instagram. I'm not a boomer. I'm Gen X, but I'm like, I might as well be. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I've, I think I've only ever gone live on Instagram once, but next week I'm going to try again. We're going to get this together. Hi, Karen. Hi, Brandy. 
Hi, holy schmoly. <laughs> Hi, lucky love joy. Lucky says, you have taught me to hug and comfort my younger self. And it works. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Seven-year-old Crystal. If I have unresolved trauma around seven-year-old Crystal, she's waiting for me. She's waiting for me to go in, get in and get out, be an envoy of the light, taking spirit with me. We heal it. We bring her back and boom, pattern is released. Facebook user. Is depression a physical thing? I never have physical ailments. I think it's because I never got to go to the doctor when I was growing up because my parents were doctors. So now if doctors are dismissive of me, it makes me cry. Aw. That's interesting. That would be an interesting dynamic because your parents are such authority figures and they're also doctors. And so now if you're present day doctors, they, they would have even like an order of magnitude more authority then maybe I would consider a doctor, for example. Yes, depression is a physical thing. So there is depressive states. I mean, we all experience that. And many of us can actually remove ourselves from those depressive states. We don't want to get out of bed, but we do. We go walk in the sunshine. We jump in the pool. We roll around with our dogs. We snap out of it. <clears throat> but depending on your physicality, depending on your chemistry, you may have um, a physical depression. This is what my husband has, and he takes medication for this, and it runs in his family. And so um, he, he gets treatment for this, and so he still has an intention about it. And he, you know, has a harder road a little bit because he has to incorporate practices and disciplines and ways of thinking, really, and therapy in order to become intentional with his thinking and feeling and his ultimate creation. So it is a physical thing. It's also an energy that can pass through us. It can get stuck in us, but we can move it out. So it really depends person to person. If you have any questions about what we went through. Hi. Hi. Oh my gosh. Nice to see you. Hello, CMK7. If no questions, um, <laughs> no questions. I'll go ahead and release everybody. But I do want to invite you guys back next uh, Friday because here's the thing. Um, this applies to your individual life. This information and truth has the power to change your individual life like radically, radically. And the more we get into Goddard, you know, outside of feeling is a secret into some of his more complex works, the more we're going to learn how to work in timelines and imaginal chambers, the more we're going to learn how to rewrite things and things of that nature. But um, I just want to create, I just want to create a, a community for all of us where we can meet and do this because it has the power to change the individual life, but it also has the power to change our community. And I believe it has the power to change the world. I believe that where two or more are gathered, their God is right in the midst of them. Their God is right in the midst of them. And the Bible says, God speaking in the Bible says, you tell me what you want me to create. You tell me how you want me to move. And Jesus said, if we ask our Father in heaven, and if we agree upon it, our Father's compelled to move. And I paraphrase. I paraphrase. So imagine we get ourselves together in our individual lives. We get our thinking and our feeling in alignment with what we want to create. And now we're impressing the subconscious and we're manifesting accordingly. But what if we joined in agreement about things, about our nation, about our planet, about the animals, about the economy? What could we do together as a collective? Just think, just imagine. Join me next Friday, 2 p.m. Central for chapter two, sleep. And I got a lot of extra goodies to give you about sleep. You know I do. Let's get into the Goddard and let's keep it going. Thank you guys so much for spending time with me. I got nothing but love for you. And I'll see you guys next week. Bye. <laughs>